Hello and welcome to The Print. In this video, we will talk about real money gaming applications. Uh, they have been in extensive news over the past few uh, past year and we have been hearing about game of skill, game of chance, taxes on these games and uh, today we have, we have with us Vikram Thampi who is co-founder and co-CEO of Games 24-7 who will take us through all these issues, talk about the industry and what are the challenges for the industry. Hi Vikram. Hey, how are you? Thank you so much for taking time to talk to us. Okay. And, uh, so uh, to start with, uh, can we talk about this whole perception uh, that is surrounding the gaming industry right now? There has been a lot of confusion, a lot of discussion on game of skill, game of chance. Uh, can you take us through that and then we can take it from there? I mean, I, I, I guess the single, the, probably the best way to look at where we stand in terms of perception, in terms of uh, consumers, our players, users, is just the number of people who are playing our games. I mean, there's well over 100 million by, by some estimates, maybe as many as 200 million people playing games of skill for real money now. Uh, you know, I think so that itself speaks a lot to the perception. People come and play these games because they involve skill. Uh, people like to use their wits, compete. And then there's obviously the money element involved, you know, and that spices things up. And so it's entertainment. Yeah. At the end of the day, the gaming industry, the skill gaming industry is part of the media and entertainment space. Um, now, unfortunately, um, you know, over the course of the last 12 months or so, there's been some amount of obfuscation between legitimate players like ourselves who run games of skill uh, and, you know, unfortunately, some operators like Mahadev, mm -hmm. you know, which came under the ED scanner. Yeah, it's under investigation. Um, you know, and so there are, unfortunately, and the government's been trying very hard to combat that. Um, a fair number of operators out there who are running games that are clearly not games of skill, mm -hmm. that are betting and gambling. Um, and it's become, uh, you know, it's definitely become a challenge for users, and I can't blame them, mm -hmm. for them to tell apart between what is legitimate, what is skill, what is chance you know, and therefore not legitimate. Um, and I think this is where the government can step in and make a substantial difference. And to be, to be fair, I think the government, you know, did make tremendous strides on that front. Meiti was appointed the Nodal Ministry, the online gaming rules were released early 2023. Uh, SROs were to be set up. Uh, and I think things are going pretty well, but now, as you know, you know, things have taken a little bit of a setback. Yeah, we, uh, uh, we, before we get to the regulations, uh, can you talk, you have been in, industry, in this industry for a very long time now. Can you first take us through, you know, how has this industry evolved and uh, what has been, you know, kind of challenges and regulatory, regulatory environment till now and then we can get to what are the issues we are facing with regulations right now. Yeah. Um, I mean, the industry, my, my earliest recollection is, you know, we were, we were on the one of, no, we were the first operator to start running games of skill. Uh, in the earliest stages, it was almost entirely Rami because Rami had clear Supreme Court, High Court judgment saying it's a game of skill. Um, subsequently, I think 2017 or so, um, and then over the next couple of years, a few high courts ruled uh, on fantasy saying it's a game of skill and the Supreme Court affirmed that. Uh, and that's when fantasy started growing very rapidly. Um, and I think until until the pandemic hit, hmm. many and fantasy were kind of the largest part of the skill gaming space. Uh, and then some new games started coming into the fray. And I think it's around the pandemic time that also a lot of the 
uh, illegitimate operators started coming in as people started spending more time online on their phones. Um, and I think for the longest period of time, the industry operated largely on the basis of legal clarity that came from Supreme Court judgments, mm. both in the case of Rami and in the case of fantasy. Uh, but now, as I said, like, you know, we've reached a point where the kind of content that is being offered online uh, supposedly as games of skill goes far beyond Rami and fantasy. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it really, again, and it's it's interesting, right? With every question you ask, I kind of come back to the same yeah. point, which is that it really is the hour of the need now for the government to step in and start drawing clear differences between what's allowed as per the law of the land and what's not allowed, what characterizes skill and what doesn't, you know. Um, and it's it's not a terribly hard problem to solve. There's, there's a fair bit of work done by prominent academic institutions, both in India, ISI, abroad, MIT, on what is the right way to differentiate between skill and charms. It's a solvable problem. It is, in fact, a solved problem. Right? The question is, how can the government adopt some of these things to differentiate between skill and charms uh, and therefore protect consumers uh, from, from operators that are not legitimate? And, and the legitimacy of operators doesn't just stop at skill versus chance, right? An operator like ourselves, you know, and most operators that are part of the e-gaming federation, uh, you know, go above and beyond yeah. in terms of player protection. So we, for instance, run, uh, there's, a, there's a significant part of our data science team that's just investing in building models that help detect players who may be playing it, who may not be playing responsibly, or in fact might be headed on a path where they eventually end up playing it responsibly, you know. Hmm. And so those players get flagged, then they're forced to take a survey which is designed by a professional psychologist based on the survey response. They can be completely shut out from the app or their limits reduced and or sent to counselors that we pay for. This is all that we do without the government mandating anything. So, you know, we are very welcoming of that. And none of none of the Mahadev style apps would be doing anything like that. They'd be happy to take as much money as they possibly can from whatever consumers, you know, without any player protection measures in place. So the government regulation is needed not just to differentiate between skill and charms, mm. but also to ensure that all operators are investing in protecting their players while driving growth in their business. I mean, I, you know, one interesting thing that also comes to my mind on, you know, the whole point about perception is, um, if I remember correctly, I think in the last, sometime in the last 12 months, there was a very large scale survey run by ISI Calcutta. Hmm. Uh, I think it was ISI Calcutta, maybe I said, you know, one of, one of the ISIs, which was trying to actually gauge how our youth and colleges that are looking for opportunities, particularly in the technology space, mm. how do they look at the gaming sector? And it was some, and this was done mostly in the southern states because that's where most of the tech industry is right now. Uh, it was something like 80% of the people, you know, in that youth segment who were, you know, just graduating from college or in college that were very interested in the gaming space, mm -hmm. thought the gaming space, you know, India could become a leader in that space and something like 60 to 70% of them that were very interested in being employed in the mm -hmm. skill gaming space, you know. So it's whichever way you look at it, right, you look at it from the point of view of people who are looking for opportunities to work in the space. At the end of the day, we are a tech industry. That's what we are. We mm -hmm. do really cool tech stuff. You know, you look at consumers, like 100, 200 million of them enjoying these games. I mean, this is this is what a sunrise sector looks like, right? And it just needs now the right support from government to get from, you know, where it is right now to getting on a sustainable growth path. Hmm. So, uh, so Vikram, we have established that we do need regulations. There is not much a consumer uh, user of the app can do to differentiate between a legal and an illegal app. Um, and last year, government came out with rules or as well, but there is nothing on ground that we have seen. There is a lot of uh, discussion on self-regulatory 
bodies uh, for the gaming industry, which now we are getting feelers that government may not be interested in that part. Why is it, like, what are the challenges to regulate this industry? Why is it difficult uh, for the government to uh, get proper regulations and, and quickly? I mean, that's a question you're going to have to ask the government, to be honest. Uh, you know, it's it's hard for me to see. It's, Is it because it's, it's a it's, new industry and everybody's Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not. I mean, let's just look back, right? I think whether you look back to other sectors in India or you look to the same sector internationally, the general, the average timeline um, in most jurisdictions that I'm aware of, where the government starts thinking about regulation to actually getting regulation in place, you know, has been two to three years mm. minimum. Like that's that's how long it takes. Um, and if you look at other sectors, I mean, you know better than I do, whether you look at e-commerce, whether you look at ride, you know, ride hailing and sharing, like any of those businesses, I mean, it took a long time. And even now, there's not like 100% clarity right so it is an evolving process so i don't think this is anything unusual i mean as an industry we were obviously hoping that once the online gaming rules came out that regulation would be quick but you know they moved very very quickly in the beginning and now things have slowed down a little bit and obviously because of elections still they'll, they'll probably not move for another few months at least uh, but if you look at the larger picture whether other sectors here or real money gaming internationally, mm. it's not an unusually long time. Like, in fact, if we had been regulated by October, November of this year, now that would have been remarkable and really, really fast, something quite unprecedented, which would have been great. We would have welcomed it. But, you know, we're, uh, we're patient. We've been around for 15 plus years. Mm. We're doing the right things. We'll continue to do the right things and continue to you know, inform the government about all the right things that we're doing, both as operators as an industry. Um, and hopefully the government will will take that step towards regulation over the next year or two. Another challenge that the industry saw was uh, GST uh, hiking rates to 28%. Uh, how has that, a lot of people had then said this would kill the industry and now we are a lot of months after the GST came in. Not that many months. It's <laughs> a just, few months. It's not even six months. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So how, what do you think of that now? How has that set back the industry? Uh, how long will we take to get, not over it, but adjusted to it? Yeah. I mean, it's a big setback. Um, it's definitely a big setback. Um, you know, our view is that It'll take the industry anywhere between 12 to 24 months. Um, you know, 12 months is best case scenario. Uh, hopefully no more than 24 months, maybe 18, to kind of get back to where it was before the new GST mm. regime kicked in. Uh, which is a substantial setback, but it's not, it's not a tax that's going to kill the industry. Um, just like us, other operators in the industry are figuring out, um, you know, how to operate um, under the new tax regime and chart a sustainable growth path. Um, and which is why when you started saying it, said, you know, yes, yeah. it's been four, four and a half months, but it's still very early uh, just in terms of the industry's ability to evolve and adjust to a new tax rate. I think that's going to take some time. Is it too early or do we have some numbers on, uh, you know, in terms of revenues, how much set, it has set back industry or how much revenue for the government has increased or too early? Well, I mean, I, I, I don't think I have, it's too early for us to comment about our business. I certainly don't know how other businesses are doing. Mm -hmm. As I said, things are rapidly evolving. Um, as far as the tax revenues are concerned, you're aware as well as I am you know, of some of the public statements mm -hmm. that the government has made on that front. But, you know, outside of that, I don't think we really have any, as I said, it's too mm -hmm. early to have any credible numbers right now. From one point I'd like to come back to is, uh, you said about using data science and uh, players playing it responsibly. Could you 
elaborate on that? One, what does that mean? How do you track? How does that help? Uh, can you give instances? Like, how does a survey help users? Well, I mean, when you're, those surveys are designed by professional psychologists, right? So essentially, they are meant to understand um, what, what does addiction really mean? Addiction means one, you're spending unhealthy, large amounts of time on something. Mm. That's not just a real money giving problem, by the way. That's a general problem with um, all entertainment on the internet, right? I mean, um, whether you look at, um, you know, watching, you know, social media, or you look at uh, online content of any form, right? Mm -hmm. Short form, long form, any kind of content. Whether you look at games that don't involve real money. I mean, people spending unhealthily large amounts of time on something like that at the cost of, let's say, their family mm -hmm. or their work, their friends, health, well-being, exercise, right? Those are all, those would all be examples of, you know, addiction. Um, with real money gaming, there's the additional component of money involved. But usually, time is the bigger factor that plays out. If you're playing for too long, then you'll also end up losing a lot of money. Um, and so, you know, that, that's what the data science team is trying to look at. But now the problem's not that easy to solve for, right? Because... Let's say you're a retired, you know, 60 year old person, 65, 70 year old person. Uh, for you, spending three, four hours a day hmm. is probably pretty cool. You know, like you've got the whole day, you still got enough time to exercise, hmm. you've got enough time to spend with your family if you spend three, four hours playing games, right? But if you're a 30 year old, married with two children and you're spending four or five hours a day playing games, that's a problem, right? Similarly, if you're a small business owner, um, you know, you're running a restaurant, you don't really do that much work, right? I mean, it's not like you are serving customers or whatever. I'm not saying those people don't work, but you might have two, three hours a day to play. But, you know, if you are a tech engineer and you're spending three hours a day during the day of playing, like that's a problem. So the, the, the reason this problem is very hard to solve is because one size doesn't fit all. Different people, for different people, you know, it'll be different amounts of time or different amounts. Same thing with money, you know. If, um, if a rickshaw driver is spending 5,000 rupees a month playing, that may be a lot of money, right? But for an IT engineer earning... I don't know, 10 lakhs a month or 5 lakhs a month, maybe spending 5,000 rupees playing games is not that much. I mean, you know how much you can spend just going out for dinner and a movie on a weekend, right? So it's a hard problem to solve. You can't be like, let's fix this number, and if somebody crosses this number, then they must be addicted, you know? Um, and that's why, that's why you need data science, you need AI, you need kind of complex models to try and figure out. And the way those models work is by looking at your trends. If you start out by playing a certain amount and then you, you know, and suddenly your play patterns spike up. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's a bad, that's not a good sign. Uh, but then maybe your play patterns spike up, but then very quickly they come back down and then you continue stable and that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just giving you some examples, but it's a fairly complex problem to solve, which is why you know, which is why our data science and AI team is a team that would work on something like that. Our technology team works with them and all of this gets translated into models that will run on our platform to flag players who our models think are not moving in the right direction. Got it. Vikram, we talked about a lot of challenges and I'd like to close this interview with you talking about opportunities that this industry represents, uh, uh, not just for, for players, for industry, uh, you know, and you talked about India becoming a leader in gaming, a possibility there. So what are the opportunities and when do you see industry, you know, sort of stabilizing a bit? I mean, this is, 
I have said this for many many years and I am continuing to say this is the most exciting gaming market in the world. Uh, the addressable market here is massive. I mean we have what is it like 65 to 70 percent of our population that's under the age of 50. Um, you know and you know it's gaming is largely a youth phenomena right which is why you're seeing such unprecedented growth in the gaming space in India. Uh, I don't think that stops for another at least five to ten years. Today we are about a three billion dollar industry. I think official estimates even after the new GST regime are that by 2028 uh, it will be between a seven to eight billion dollar industry. Um, my view is that that's somewhat conservative. I think we'll end up doing yeah. much more than that. Uh, so I think it's a very, very promising space. And I think the moment, the other reason the regulation and clarity from the government is very important is because the moment you have an accepted way of differentiating between skill and chance, this allows a lot more content to be produced. Today as an operator, we are extraordinarily conservative in what new games we put out there, you know, because there is no government, Rami and Fantasy have Supreme Court judgments, right? But how many games will have Supreme Court judgments? Mm -hmm. So how does an operator know whether game X is okay and game Y is not, you know? Um, so I think the moment the clarity comes, that will also open up a whole era of innovation in terms of content because developers will have confidence on, if I meet these rules, then I can launch this game. Mm -hmm. So more innovation. Uh, more games, more entertainment. Um, so it's, I think it's a, I think we're in a super exciting market, super exciting point in time. Uh, and, you know, regulations will really help. In some ways, regulations actually slow you down, mm. right? Because you're required to do more. But in this case, regulations, while some of that will happen and that's required for player protection, um, and addressing government concerns around addiction, money laundering. But at the same time, regulations will also, as I said, open up whole new avenues for growth in terms of new content. Great. On that note, uh, we come to the end of this interview. Thank you so much, Vikram, for joining us. And thank you so much for joining us. Keep watching. The video.